Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Hudson Library tonight. We will give our attendees just a moment to get in our Zoom tonight, and then we'll get started with our author program. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here at the Hudson Library um, for our virtual author program with historical fiction writer Suzanne Dunlap. We are delighted to have her with us today for a conversation about her latest book, The Portraitist, which details um, Adele Labie Guillard's fight to take her place in the competitive art world in 18th century Paris. Suzanne Dunlap is the author of 12 works of historical fiction for adults and teens as well as an author accelerator certified book coach. Her love of historical fiction arose partly from her studies in music history at Yale University, partly from her lifelong interest in women in the arts as a pianist and nonprofit performing arts executive. Her novel, The Paris Affair, was the first place SIBA award winner, and The Musician's Daughter was a Junior Library Guild selection and a Bank Street Children's Book of the Year. So thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, we do have copies available for purchase of um, Suzanne's book, The Portraitist. We will have a link in the chat um, for the Learned Owl Bookshop that has provided copies for us. If you'd like to get your book tonight, you can use that link in the chat. Well, Suzanne, thanks for your time. And um, of course, we would love to hear more about what it's like being a um, historical fiction author, as well as a lot about your new book, um, and actually you have another new book coming out too. So maybe we can hear a little bit about your next work in progress as well. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. I, <clears throat> I'm one of those people who could talk forever <laughs> about <laughs> historical fiction and, and especially my books. They become very, well, two interesting things. They become extremely uh, important to me, obviously, because I've spent years literally writing this book. I started this book, I think, The Portraitist, I think I started in 2015. Wow. And it, <clears throat> yeah, even, I did other things as well, but it but it took a long time for that to, to sort of get to the point where it finally was ready. Um, but the other thing that happens is because I write another, I write other books after that, is that there's this weird thing where I completely forget everything <laughs> in the book. So sometimes if you see me sort of reaching for my book and looking, it, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was reading um, on your on your author's webpage that you kind of first became interested in writing historical fiction from your trip, um, a 1960s trip that you took in Europe. Was it like six? six days, seven countries. Yeah. And you had uh -huh. just an amazing, it sounded like an amazing experience that kind of inspired you to, to write historical fiction. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I'm, it, I think the actual impetus to write it didn't come until quite a bit later, but what it did is introduce me to the world of historical fiction because mm -hmm. I had not really read, read much. Um, we were at the end, I was with the uh, family of a girl I was going to be going to high school with. And we did one of those trips that you just can't do anymore, where we hopped around to seven different countries, stayed in the absolute best hotels, ate at the best restaurants in every country. And our final stop was London, where we stayed at the Savoy, <laughs> and, which was pretty amazing. <laughs> anyway, yeah. But we'd been in all these different places that weren't English speaking. And so when we got to London, one of the first things I did, because I'd read every book I brought with me, we went to a bookstore. And it was around the time that um, the musical Camelot was out and being made into a movie. And so they had the, um, I picked up the copy of T.H. White's The Wonder King, which is <clears throat> a fabulous book, really, really wonderful. I, and I just completely devoured it. And I think that began my uh, my love of historical fiction, of seeing that you could write stories. Now, of course, King Arthur is kind of a legend rather than real history, but there's you know still there's there's things about it that are historical, of course. So, yeah. 
in in writing historical fiction, what is your process? So it sounds like you had you, you said you started um, this book in 2015. What's your process for making your your book authentic for your readers? Um, <clears throat> that's a really good question. <laughs> uh, the thing is, the, I have written so many historical novels that it's almost hard to sort of pick apart exactly what I do and how that happens. Um, Part of it is I have a sort of bank of knowledge about the periods that I'm writing in, about the things that I'm writing in. I also was once, I, I used to uh, buy and sell vintage clothing and textiles. So I'm very, very picky about the clothing. Even if it doesn't go into detail, I know what she's wearing under all that stuff. You know? <laughs> so, um, so basically making something feel authentic is all about choosing the right details and, and not sort of describing them like saying she wore a green beige gown at, with trimmed with whatever, unless you're writing about the whole fashion industry for some reason, but in sort of trying to get inside and how it must have felt to be in those clothes to be in a carriage what they would have heard how paris for instance was a very different place in the 18th century than it was after Haussmann did his big thing and created all those avenues that we think of as paris now they just didn't exist then so yeah details i think do you um do you write your historical fiction novels that do they air closer to more historical details or do you, do you like to kind of be more imaginative in your writing? Uh, it's a combination. Actually, a lot, of, a lot of my novels, I have fictional protagonists in real situations. That gives me a lot more uh, freedom, <laughs> as it were. Because here's the funny thing about history is it does not arrange itself in neat story arcs. So it can be really hard to find a story buried in, in the history of a real person. Um, of course, the portraitist is about a real person, but I had some freedom because this, this particular real person, Adelaide Labiguiar, her, this, her biography is very sketchy. There are things, we know basic things, but a lot of it is missing it's kind of conjecture anyway that there you know uh things like we don't know why her father sold his his uh atelier and went and worked in a in a uh government position but i i but that's the thing with her is that i it gave me the freedom to say okay he needs to stay there for my book. So, so I'm not going to have him leave and go to take the government position, so to speak. Um, yeah. Can you, what was the question again? I see I go off on these tangents and um, I lose my oh, train of I, thought. I just asked if, if your writing kind of lends more towards the historical right. details or if you, you kind of have flexibility with, with um, being more imaginative and, and filling in the gaps. Right, right. And I did. I made up I made up certain things. All of the actual events that happen in in this is very they're all historical. Everything that happened with the revolution, her paintings, when they were painted, her her affair with uh, with uh, André Vincent, that's all historical. What isn't historical are a couple of those subplots that I invented, you know, because the big questions that are left unanswered when you're looking up, looking for information is, is why, you know, why did she, why did this happen? Why was her, was she such a rival to, to Elizabeth Vigée Le Guin, who was, um, who was Marie Antoinette's official portraitist? And why didn't she put anything into a, a an exhibition until she was much older? Why, you know, and you have to, you have to, you have to figure that out for yourself because it's not in the historical record. In in your research, did you come across any kind of like primary resources from her? Any kind the, of journal? There's one one letter, one letter. She did not, unlike her rival 
Elizabeth, who wrote, who lived to a ripe old age and wrote a three volume autobiography, which we have, or three volume memoir, which is, you know, people, her her memory was probably a little bit suspect, <laughs> but actually that that memoir I I originally started out thinking I would write about her, because there's a lot more of her pictures surviving. In fact, I think I think there are probably about four hundred existing now, whereas the pictures that actually survive for Adelaide number about seventy five, and because a lot of hers were thrown on a bonfire in, in the revolution. So, excuse me, my dog's whining at me. Shh, sorry. <laughs> but anyway, um, <clears throat> so, and my dog distracted me. <laughs> what was your question? I'm sorry. Honestly, I tried to remember myself. <laughs> um, so what, I don't know. I lost my place. I guess we'll. That's go all right. That's all right. We, we just on. we'll just go on. We'll just go on. Oh, um, I, oh! I think it was about writing about, not about real people. Oh, was okay. He's still writing about real people. Well, um, oh, I know what I was going to say is that I originally thought I was going to write about uh, Elizabeth because there was a lot more information about her, and I. The nice thing about eBooks, I love having real books. I have tons of real, you know, physical books, but eBooks you can you can do a search. <laughs> <laughs> and I did a search for in Elizabeth's um, memoir for Adelaide and La Biguiar and all that sort of stuff and Madame Guiar and whatever. She doesn't mention her once. And the two of them dogged each other's footsteps all through to the beginning of the revolution, where Adelaide stayed and Elizabeth fled. And <clears throat> so that made me think, huh. You know, what's this about? <laughs> Why doesn't she even mention her when they were both elected to the academy at this in the same year? They they exhibited in all the same uh, same uh, shows in the in the academy ex exhibits. Also, in the very first, they both of them had their very first public exhibition in this at the same time. So, you know, we don't know how they responded to each other, whether they ever saw each other at the, during that time. And the first, my first scene is Adelaide going there and seeing her from a distance, um, seeing Elizabeth from a distance. I don't know if that happened, but that's where the imagination comes in is what must she have felt like to see this 19 year old painter with, with all these noble clients where she was struggling and you know, didn't have any, that we know of any sort of formal training or anything like that. She didn't come from an artistic family. Her father was a, a milliner basically. So that was, that was what made me fascinated at the whole idea. And first I thought, well, I'm gonna write a book about both of them. And then that just got too huge and unwieldy and I finally realized that the, the, the protagonist had to be Adelaide because she was the underdog through this whole thing. Um, and she also stayed through the revolution. Whereas Elizabeth left in 1789, but she had, she, had, she had ties to the court that were dangerous. She was Marie Antoinette's portraitist. And even though Adelaide had, a, had an appointment for Mesdames, the king's aunts, she was far enough away and she was involved in all these Republican things that her, it was, she had to sort of straddle a line, but I don't think she was ever in danger of being guillotined, whereas Elizabeth would have been. And in fact, Elizabeth's good friend uh, was, was, was also an artist, a pastelist, Rosalie Fillol did end up being guillotined. So. You've, um, so you've written 12 books and some of, a couple of your books are um, written for teens. Mm -hmm. Do you find, um, it, what's different about your writing process when you're writing for adults versus young adults? Um, I think all my young adult books are first person, first of all. Mm -hmm. And I tend to write in third person for adults. I'm not sure why exactly. 
But um, also the difference between adult books and young adult books, it, the writing is the same. I don't write any, I don't hold back my expression or anything like that. What differs is what's important, what's at the heart of the story and the age of the protagonist. Uh, so my my young adult book, books, I had so much fun writing and especially my, my uh, young violinist, my young Viennese violinist, Therese Sherman, who um, I was still writing a lot about musicians then, or about music then, and, and she just, her voice just came to me, you know, she was just this lively kid who was forced to play the viola because girls weren't encouraged to play the violin because it was, you know, not a seemly instrument for girls in the, the in the 18th century. In fact, Mozart's sister was probably a better violinist than he was, but she was not allowed to perform it in public. Factoid there. But <clears throat> so the approach is no different. I still have to do all the same research. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, in Anastasia's Secret, it's it's the uh, Romanov court and everything. And I really knew very little about it. I spent quite a while really digging into the relationships and stuff. The, the nice thing about that, though, is there's a lot of sources because it was later and all that sort of thing. But it's so funny because speaking of sources and, and being able to to find the information about about these people, women. I have the the stack of books I have that that deal with Adelaide is about this big. The stack of books I have for Elizabeth is like this big. <laughs> so it, it's just in. I just couldn't. I just needed to take her out of obscurity somehow, you know. So you have um, kind of an interesting background. You have a PhD from Yale in music history. Yeah. Um, and a couple of your books you've written more um, historical figures in music, um, like The Musician's Daughter, Mozart's Conspiracy. Is art history also another area that you're very interested in? Well, I like, I, I really, I sort of think of myself as being really interested in women in, involved in the arts. Okay. Um, and I've been a lifelong art lover. My parents were very big on all of that and I grew up going to galleries and and traveling in Europe all the art galleries were the first thing on the list so to speak that and then going to concerts and operas and things like that so it's it's not quite I don't I don't know as much about art history as I know about music history but when you're writing fiction historical fiction you don't have to be an expert because your readers aren't experts what you need to be able to do is find the story bring it to life be accurate and you know there's this this thing that people like to say that's write what you know and i would say don't do that write what you are curious about or write what you want to know, you know, because especially with historical fiction, digging into the research, you learn so much. And I have friends who are artists. So, so when I had to, you know, when it came to describing her process painting and that sort of thing, I relied on them. And I also read, I mean, amazing resources you can find out there. I read an 18th century treatise on painting. So. Well, have um, sounded like you've been to a lot of art museums in your in your day and um have you actually been able to see in person a uh, la Bie Guillard pa uh, portrait oh, painting? several several the the metropolitan museum in, in new york has has the painting that's on the cover of my mm -hmm. book and i've seen that's always been one of my favorites i would go there and just make a pil pilgrimage just to see that particular painting and um they have a couple of others. And what was really, uh, <clears throat> I used to live in Northampton, Massachusetts. I went to Smith and I used the Smith, Smith has a wonderful art gallery and they had a uh, an exhibit of 
I think I can't remember the name of the exhibit, but I think it was 18th century portraits. And there was an Adelaide La Biguiar portrait that I had never seen before from a private collection that was in that particular exhibit. And what's really interesting, these are I'm talking about details. I make a comment at some pl point in the book where she's talking about how she misses when uh, men aren't wearing wigs anymore, the, the sort of drift of wig powder. That portrait was of a man and there were little bits of wig powder on his shoulder. And so that's where I got that whole idea from. I bet, I mean, just looking at the cover of your book that has the, um, the self-portrait with two pupils, I think is the name of the painting. Mm -hmm. And I, I put the link in the chat for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The website, they said um, that it's currently not on view. So I don't know if it's. Oh, I, I probably haven't seen it. I haven't been to the Met for a couple of years. Yeah. But um, they may have loaned it out for an exhibition or something like that. Yeah, they they have a really cool website, though. They You can kind of look at all the different details about the um, piece of art. And they also had a sound clip that you can listen to a. Um, an art historian kind of disseminate the painting itself, which is kind of cool to listen to as well. Yeah, yeah. But I can't imagine, like, looking at the detail in her silk dress, I can't even imagine what that would look like in person to kind of take in the amount of detail in the feather on her hat. Like, it's, it's really like you are looking at a picture. Yeah, yeah. Well, but that was sort of the photography of the time. You know, there was, that was how, but and it was also a way to, I mean, that painting was her calling card, really, saying, I am uh, a woman portraitist available for hire, and I look presentable, and I have two devoted students, and, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it was a calculated, I believe, a calculated uh, gesture to paint that particular painting and it's amazing that it survived the revolution yeah so well, I mean all the books that you've written are kind of centered around a strong female character I mean I know you've touched on this a little bit but your writing do you kind of feel um compelled for your writing to kind of have these voices of these women that are kind of overshadowed by the aristocracy or male institutions patriarchal systems of the 18th and 19th centuries? Are you the voice of these kind of hidden hidden women? I try to be. <laughs> I definitely, it's what interests me. What's It's what draws it, me to it. And I mean, when I was uh, doing music scholarship, I always did it with a feminist lens, you know? So, uh, so even though, I mean, there are probably more known women artists than known women composers, even though there were women, plenty of women composers, partly because <clears throat> art was something you could do in private and at home, and you didn't have to, you know, be a spectacle. Music, in order to exist, has to be performed. So there's that whole, uh, whether it's seemly or not, for a woman to be out in public. And that's why actresses and people like that were thought of as little little better than whores, honestly. Um, <clears throat> and that was something I think that that Adelaide certainly fought against was this perception that she must be a woman of loose morals because uh, she dares to put to be a professional. Sure. So, yeah. Well, and there were plenty of women doing things. That's the other thing. The problem is that I think in the 19th and 20th century, when when men were writing the canon, were actually rec recording the history. <clears throat> I think earlier times there was um, women were more present. They kind of got pushed to the background during the Victorian era, and so it's a like, uh, it's kind of we have to go back before that to find to find all the good stuff about women in a in a way well I think um to kind of really um, really uh appreciate what a determined woman that she was I think um your reader kind of has to have some background um of what was going on in France during that time in the 18th century I think um can you kind of set the scene for us a little bit just give us a preview of 
maybe a little sure. bit. Sure. Oh, sure. Well, <clears throat> most the bulk of this book takes place before the revolution, but there was a lot of stuff going on. It was a very there was a lot of turbulent politics and everything, and and the whole art world was controlled by basically one man who really didn't like women to be artists and he sort of he basically did everything he could to keep people like Adelaide and Elizabeth from being elected as members of the academy the thing is that you there were very few places artists could show their work in public and because he kept closing them down <laughs> so so the final one was the was the the academy at the Louvre um, the Louvre then was not an, an art gallery the way it is now. There was a, an exhibition hall, the Cour Carré, or the <clears throat> Salon Carré. But it was also a place where there were um, apartments and studios. So grace and favor things that, that you could, if you were a member of the Academy, you could get um, one of these great studios in the Louvre for free. And you could just live there where <clears throat> that's one thing that Adelaide wanted. She was, she was always strapped for cash and she really wanted to be able to have her a Louvre studio, but she was, uh, that every time she asked, she was denied because it was going to be a, uh, a bad influence to have women running around inside the Louvre. Forget that there were women there anyway, but you know. It would be her, her students would, would lead the men astray somehow or other. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture, because that's kind of, um, it plays a significant role in her, in her life. So even though there were only a handful of women actually accepted into the academy, these women still weren't given a lot of the same opportunities that men were, even though they Absolutely. were part of that academy. Right. I mean, they weren't they weren't allowed to teach in the Louvre. They couldn't. Um, I mean, Adelaide really was almost as famous as a teacher as she was as a painter. I mean, she really, uh, unlike Elizabeth, who really didn't want to teach, she obviously gained something from it, had some very talented students, but she couldn't teach until after the revolution, until the early 19th century. She could not teach in the Louvre, she, and also women could not attend the classes that were held in the Louvre either. So the, um, but they could study privately with the with some of the, for instance, Adelaide's teacher was uh, uh, Maurice Quentin de La Tour, the, this really fine pastelist, probably the best pastelist of his age, and he she he studied with her, and she he thought very highly of her abilities. But she couldn't go, women couldn't go to the life drawing classes in the Louvre. Like that was just absolutely not done. And <clears throat> the other thing they couldn't do, men could compete for the Prix de Rome, which was a great honor. And they would go and study the Roman, uh, go to Rome and study the paintings, the Italian art in the beautiful sunlight of Italy and that sort of thing. Women could not do that. So, uh, yeah, there were, they could be elected. Only four, though, were allowed to be in it at any one time. And they could be elected, but they couldn't really didn't benefit from a lot of the privileges that the men had. Yeah, I was reading um, that the, uh, the academy, they had a hierarchy of mm -hmm. memberships. And um, basically, the top of the hierarchy was your artists that would do like history paintings and portraiture and then you have genre paintings and then at the bottom was like landscape and uh, still life and mm -hmm. because a lot of, because these women were not given the opportunity to take some of the um like nude male painting or figure drawing they they would never have been able to get to that hierarchy of portraiture or history paintings because they yeah. never had these core foundational classes that they were excluded from. Right. Although it's mainly history painting they couldn't do because okay. Adelaide Adelaide was admitted as a portraitist. Right. Um, but she her portraits and she did men and women with right. their clothes off. You know? <laughs> but um, <clears throat> the history painting was the highest one 
And that there's an interesting story about that. Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun had aspirations. She wanted to be admitted as a history painter. And her, her piece that she submitted to, to be elected to the Academy was an allegory. It was peace bringing, peace ushering in abundance. And it was to commemorate the end of the American war, which the French had subsidized heavily. And um, so she did this allegorical thing. Well, they didn't consider it a history painting because it wasn't a classical subject. So she not only didn't get admitted as a history painter, she didn't get admitted as a portraitist. She just was a painter in oils, which was, you know, kind of a little bit of a dig at her. So, um, yeah, it was difficult. They, they both had to sort of make it up as they went along, I guess. <laughs> you know? no. Elizabeth, she actually was the portraiture or portraitist of um, the queen, but Adelaide, she did more of the, um, was it the court? Adelaide was the mesdame and, and she did the, you know, the, they were, they were not, they had apartments in Versailles, but, but the king's aunts hated Marie Antoinette. And they, so they kind of decamped to their own uh, chateau of Belleville and, beautiful place um and so that's where adelaide would go to paint their portraits their official portraits and things but but this appointment came with no money what had happened is that they would agree to have her paint their portraits but then the money always came after it was done so she was always shelling out money for oil paints and materials and rent for her her studios and that sort of thing. And that actually brings up the, the, the sort of biggest tragedy, I guess, <laughs> of her actual career. Right in 1780, early 1789, she received this commission from, from uh, the Comte de Provence, who was the king's next younger brother, who became Louis XVIII after the revolution but <clears throat> to paint this massive canvas uh i can't remember how many feet i have it somewhere but it's not in my head but it was absolutely huge uh to put in the école militaire which the king had given to this order of hospitallers who are a sort of a like a, the equivalent of the knights of the garter or something like that for for the french and it was supposed to have, it was going to be this scene where he was giving the, uh, awarding the, the, the honor to these men who were, you know, and, and they had to have certain men. And anyway, it was a huge, huge thing that, that would have been appropriate for a history painter to paint, but it was given to her. She was going to earn, when it was done, the fee that she would get was 30,000 livres, which is a lot of money. And but she had to shell out about five thousand of her own money in order to do it, and so this was 1789, right? And she probably got it close to finished, but then she had to flee Paris, go out to the suburbs to get away when the when the terror started, and um, a lot of her pictures were were thrown on a bonfire and just out of ignorance out of what who knows what and probably that one was as well in other words she never saw a penny for that massive painting and um and it doesn't survive there is a, a sort of oil sketch that survives so that's all we kind of know about it but um she uh <clears throat> <laughs> it seemed to be she could she just couldn't earn enough money all the way through her life she was always struggling but uh yeah, so by contrast, Elizabeth, because she fled, because she really had to, spent those years in between before, you know, after the, during and after the revolution, traveling to different European courts and painting portraits of Russians and Austrians and Italians and all that sort of stuff. And, um, and a lot of her, a lot of her, her portraits have survived because of that. So 
don't know if it's if it's known at all, but I just, just out of curiosity, I wonder how long it took to do one of these portraits. Yeah, well, that's interesting because I think like, I think they were really, I think for instance, Elizabeth was really fast. I think she could paint pretty quickly because, and, and not only that, but you know, they'd paint a portrait and then the queen would say, oh, I need a copy for this person and a copy for that person. And of course you can't put it on a plate and, and make a copy of it. It has to actually be painted. So, um, so they, they had to be pretty proficient and quick. Um, and I, I don't, I, I don't think there's anything that I've read that gives an actual amount of time it would take for somebody to do it, but also one of the things I have Adelaide say is that, is that, that, or I might have been Elizabeth, I don't remember, but she says that, that they assume that like the men, they have a whole studio of acolytes who can do the copies for them and fill in the bits and paint, you know, um, some of the, some of the most famous men would just do the faces, the heads, and let their, let the people in the studio do the rest of the, the drapery and that sort of thing. But I don't think that neither of them had that. So they just had to, they had to be really good and really fast. <laughs> I know, um, and, and this was in your book, but a lot, it, Adelaide, um, like probably many talented women of the time in creative arts, um, she was confronted with allegations that her work was almost too good that they didn't believe that a woman could truly have done that. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it, the thing is that, as she said, she said in, in the book, she says to Andre when she said, when he says, well, why don't you let me help you with this big thing? I can come in. And she said, if you walk by the door, they'll think that you did it, not me. <laughs> you know? And, and it's just, it, it's just a prejudice that they had that women couldn't be able to do this, that women would be too, uh, you know, wouldn't have the strength, wouldn't have the um, the stamina, whatever it was. But uh, yeah, it was that another thing that they fought all the time, and uh, and 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 the pamphlets would would print rumors that such and such an artist had touched up her painting because it, you know, or something like that. It was a struggle, yeah. We had um, we had a presentation last week by the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, Washington yeah. D.C. And they're um, they're a museum that's solely dedicated to um, only having women artists in their in the museum, which is a kind of a unique collection. Um, but the museum they had um, they talked about there was a investigation or a investigation done by Artnet News uh, 2019, so not that long ago. Um, and they found that artwork by women artists only constitutes of 11% of acquisitions by American museums. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's, of course, just, a, you know, not looking at European museums, but it's, it's kind of eye opening that, you know, even here in the 21st century, we are still women are still significantly underrepresented in art museums in acquisitions. And um, I think it was African American women are even less only 3% of yeah. all acquisitions um, are made by African-American women. So it's great that you're being um, an advocate for <laughs> these <laughs> for these kind of under, um, these women that maybe weren't, uh, were, are trailblazers in history, but unfortunately were kind of silenced by some of the overarching uh, uh, aristocracy and male, you know, patriarchal. Yeah. Patriarchal. Patriarchals. Yeah, things were set up to be good for for the men to, and and women just had to sort of do their best to work around it or get through it or whatever. Um, and I think it's remarkable, in fact, that even that painters like Elizabeth and Adelaide even rose to the top. You know, um, so yeah, and it, yeah, it's so interesting because I the museums in the United States that have works by Adelaide you just told me something I didn't know which was that the the that the uh her self-portrait with two students isn't on on display right now but it's I sense that it must be off being either fixed up or something or whatever because it's a pretty important 
painting. Yeah. Um, but the, I think the Getty Museum has another a portrait by Adelaide and, and it's just in storage. It's not displayed. So that's the other thing. It's not, it's not just what the acquisitions are. It's what actually gets to be on the wall that people see right. because museums don't have the wall space to actually display all the art they own. Well, before we take, um, we'll kind of wrap our conversation up here. Before we take um, some of our audience questions, and it looks like we have some already. I know you have another book coming out in April. Can you tell us just a little bit about it, what, what it's about? Well, it's completely different. <laughs> it actually takes, it's also women. It's a, it's a, it's a mother-daughter story that takes place in 1910 New York. And it's set against the backdrop of the early film industry in New York. So that's a women in film is, is sort of where it uh, is the artistic part of it. And it's the, the daughter wants to be a famous uh, an, uh, an actress in the movie, in the silent pictures, like the Vitagraph girl. And uh, her mother wants her to be a seamstress. Her mother is the, well, what you don't really know is who's the courtesan's daughter, in fact, but um, the mother has a, a secret from her time in France and the daughter secrets end up always end up being found out one way or the other but that was some that was a lot of fun to research and write because again you know the women were involved in the early film industry um, so mostly it was Edison and and uh, you know and his coterie but but women there was a woman and of course I might I can't call her name to mind because I'm terrible about names and it's getting late at night for me but um a French woman who was very influential in the in she she actually had her own production company and um she she is in this in my book as well she she did come to New York and and have a have a studio in Queens and so, but it was really a lot of fun to, to get into that world. Well, it sounds like you've been busy this year writing. Yeah. <laughs> well, that one, that one, I think I started in like 2017. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't just write it this year. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, we have, uh, we have some questions here and I'll, I'll go ahead and read some of those here to you. Um, Catherine asked, who were Adelaide Elizabeth's male contemporaries? I'm sorry, can you say that again? You cut out a little. Oh, okay. Who were Adelaide and Elizabeth's male contemporaries? Okay, uh, Jacques-Louis David is one. Uh, uh, André Vincent was her lover, who was also a very um, very famous history painter who, who actually won the Prix de Rome. Um, I'm trying to think of the, and then there was, of course, there was uh, Maurice Quentin de la Tour, which who who Adelaide studied with. Uh, some of them, there. Were, I, I, I'm trying to think which of the names. I think David is the most famous of them. Um, uh, I'd have to look up more of them, but but that's the sort of thing that was going on. David actually was was is kind of a bit of an antagonist yeah. in the book because he he was he was a very interesting character but um he pushed the the style into something new a very good painter but uh he wasn't very nice to adelaide <laughs> um i know you kind of answered this one but carol asked to consider historical fiction um, how much of your story has to be considered historical versus fiction or is that just kind of your freedom of expression in writing um, it's it's pretty loose uh to be it has to be accurate really to be historic you can't just sort of just sort of say oh i want to write about this period and i'll just imagine what it's like um real historical fiction really does involve a lot of research and you do your best to recreate a period or place or per people at the time that said, there are a lot of historical fiction subgenres. For instance, historical mystery, which is generally a mystery, probably often a made up mystery that takes place in a certain time. Then there's historical romance, which everybody knows about, you know, uh, 
Bridgerton kind of thing where where really it's it's all from the imagination, but the period is is fairly accurately represented. So and and for instance, the difference between these two books, my the portraitist and the, the one that's coming out, is the portraitist is really biographical historical fiction because it's about a real person. Excuse me. Whereas the courtesan's daughter has a lot of real historical people in, but the central characters are fictional. They're that I'm I made up. So it, it really depends on the on the writer as much as anything. Catherine asked a uh, fascinating history. Can anyone uh, can anyone view any of her work in this country? So we we know that um, her mo most fam famous one is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I know the um, National Museum of Women in the Arts, they have one of her portraits there. Anywhere else that you know of offhand? Not really, no. I mean, there are a lot more in Europe. I think the uh, museum at Versailles has several of hers uh, and, and quite a few of Elizabeth's as well. But, and and I think a lot, several have, have ended up in private collections. So, you know, you can't really go and see them, unfortunately. Um, she just had so few that actually survived, comparatively speaking. Um, Jean asked, and maybe she can clarify, um, could they ever start their own? And I'm wondering maybe if that was um, like a, a portrait, like a painting academy of their own. I'm not sure if that's what she meant by that. Oh, that's an interesting idea. But the problem is there was no place they could do it there was no sort of way they could have there was no there was no uh, infrastructure for them to do something like that um it it was hard enough just to be a woman kind of operating in this patriarchal art world i think they would have been shut down really fast if they sort of banded together and said we don't need you <laughs> and then the question is too the problem is that that being a member of the academy is was good for business so because people would say oh you know my portrait was painted by so-and-so who's a member of the academy so it was all about prestige too so uh i think it would have been really difficult <laughs> to do that people were any of the since that under her did they become famous artists that are known at all or um her her most famous student student is um uh <laughs> some whose name i can't call to mind but she's one of the two students in that portrait in that okay. picture and she is a very good artist in there and there's a bunch of her work is has survived um uh marie not Marie Marguerite, no, the other one. Okay. Marie Gabrielle. That <laughs> was Marie Gabrielle. Um, okay. Yeah, she was the one. And she, she there's a gorgeous self-portrait that she painted that that you can find if you go and looking looking on the web. Um, and I don't know where 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 it is, what museum it's in. But so she had a an actual career. But the, the thing about Adelaide is that she she died at the age of 52. And um, uh, we don't know what, and I don't, I was never able to find out where she was buried. Um, her then husband, because they finally were able to marry, she did, she got a separation from her first husband, but divorce was illegal until after the revolution. And they finally married. <clears throat> he lived uh, another 15 or 20 years. He was younger than she was too. Um, and when he died and his estate was sold off, he was a very well-known painter, André Vassin. And um, his works were sold for some thousands of francs or whatever the currency was at the time. He had a bunch of Adelaide's paintings and hers went for pennies, literally pennies. So, yeah kind of shocking. <laughs> yeah. Um, Catherine, it's, do you have any um, favorite contemporary female artists? Oh. Um, you would ask me about names. <laughs> what is the one? Uh, uh, is it Judy Chicago? The one who had the, yeah, I, I love her. 
um, contemporary. Now, now uh, Georgia O'Keeffe is not contemporary, but I do love her work. Um, and uh, I don't, I'm not so steeped in the art world today that I can sort of rattle off, you know, living artists, but um, I always notice when I go to museums and see the, see the, the names. Yeah, I'm, cause that's, you know, I'm history. I like the old stuff. <laughs> uh, one of our patrons asked, do you know, did um, any of her students go beyond portraits? Did they learn beyond just painting portraits from Adelaide or was that strictly what they were instructed uh, in? That's basically what they were instructed in. And, and part of that is that, that it was seen as okay for women to do portraits because they were sort of there was something kind of domestic about them there's actually a wonderful portrait by gabrielle of of uh adelaide actually in her studio in the louvre teaching and, it, and this was you know in the late 18th century that's one of her famous pictures but there's that's other than the self-portrait there there's not that many where we have an image of adelaide who was who uh, you know elizabeth painted tons of self-portraits. She was a beauty. She was really, really pretty. Adelaide, not so much. So <laughs> that, was, that was kind of, you know, but um, yeah. So well, yeah, they would, they would, the, the thing is that being a portraitist could get, make you a living. You could actually earn your keep being a portraitist, which is why, you know, they, they taught it. Um, I think we'll end here. Susanna was more or less a comment at the center announcement. Hello? What? Sorry, I was just muting for a moment because our announcements come on over the library speaker. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, um, I missed that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Susanna said that she really liked this uh, from your book, and this was a quote from your book. It was as if the real Gabrielle had been asleep within the artist, only venturing out in tentative steps until the fabric of society tore enough of her to step through and announce herself to the world. <laughs> so that was just a comment, but um, I think a good place to end for tonight. <laughs> Thank you, um, everybody, so much for your questions and, of course, for joining us tonight here at the Hudson Library. And Suzanne, um, Suzanne, thank you so much for um, the conversation tonight. And we certainly look forward to your new book that comes out in April. And of course, The Portraitist. If you want to get your copy tonight, we have copies available. Um, link is in the chat if you would like your copy of The Portraitist. So thank you, everybody. Have a lovely evening. Take care. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciated it. Great. We did too. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.